stay, 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 stay. Okay, come. It's Jenna with Dog Liaison Training where I help you better enhance your dog's mental health. And on this channel, we like to break down research evidence to help better inform us on how to train dogs. If you are interested in getting nerdy and understanding canine cognition from a scientific approach, this channel is for you. Consider subscribing today. We are breaking down the four biggest mistakes I see owners make when they are teaching stay. And we are getting started right now. The first mistake I see pet parents make, and a couple of dog trainers too, is that they walk backwards from the dog. I know that the purpose of this is so that we can keep an eye on the dog and make sure that they are not releasing before we ask them to, but it seems a little counterintuitive. I mean, how impractical it is to walk backwards from your dog. I don't know about you, but I don't spend a whole lot of time walking backwards anyway, but let alone looking at my dog and doing it. <laughs> I mean, if I'm gonna walk backwards, I tend to be a little bit more cautious. So it seems very counterintuitive to do this. And to be completely frankly, you're gonna save a whole lot of time if you just turn around naturally and walk back away naturally. So when you put your dog in the stay, I want you to think about your first objective is I just want to be able to turn my body this way. And once you can turn your body this way, you'll yes, and then you release. And then you put your dog in another stay and you turn your body this way. Then you'll say yes, and you'll release. And then you're gonna put your dog back in a stay and you'll turn back this way and you'll say yes, and you'll release, <laughs> okay? And release treat. Now, you want to take it in these little itty bitty steps because if you just go straight to turning your back on the dog, then likely you are going to make the dog move because they don't know what's going on. So you want to think of the little transition here as a bridge. Okay. Um, once you're able to turn your back all the way to the dog, now you can start walking away. So if you can't even turn your back on your dog, there's really no reason to be even worrying about distance at all and walking away from your dog whatsoever. Uh, make sure you can practically walk away with your dog without actually breaking a limb. The second mistake I see owners make is that they repeat the cue stay too many times and generally they change their tone. Stay, 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 stay. If this sounds like you, don't worry. We've all been there. We've done that. We've all had those human moments, but it's important that from now moving forward, we stop saying the cue that many times and repeating it like that. Now, I do want to add the caveat that I'm not completely 100% against repeating cues. In fact, I made an entire video that looks like this, and I'll link it at the end of the video as well, uh, but it's all about when the two contexts are that you would actually repeat a cue. So if the stay falls under those two categories that you might need to repeat a cue, then my, by all means say stay again. But if you feel like you're saying stay for the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, likely you're either A, causing the dog to think this. Why does fool man keep saying stay? I thought I does the stays. Is this not the stays I does? Or B, maybe they don't understand and your expectations are too high. And in a moment, we are going to talk about how we set criteria. But for right now, if you feel the need to have to say stay two, three, 12 times to get your dog to actually stay planted, then likely your expectations of that stay are too high and you need to diminish your criteria. More on that topic coming up. The third mistake that I see owners make is that they do not have a, a release cue established. A release cue could be literally just release or free, but it could also just be a marker word like yes that tells them that the behavior is over. Often what I see is that owners will use the treat or the toy as the indication that a, that a behavior is over. And this usually means that the dog becomes too reliant on 
a specific reward in order to perform the cue. What ends up usually happening in cases like this is that the dog becomes reliant on the movement of the treat, the movement of the toy to tell them that the behavior is over. So the second that you eliminate the treat or the toy from the equation, now the dog can no longer know when the behavior is over and he'll just end up sitting there and you'll be saying release or you'll be saying whatever word you say, like come. And the dog's just going to look at you like, I don't know what you want uh, because they're so dependent on the movement of the toy or the movement of the treat to indicate to them that the stay has ended. why it's so important that you use a release cue like release free, all done, or just yes, use some sort of verbal cue or visual cue that indicates to your dog that yes, the behavior is over. Now you can move. Now you get the reinforcer. So what it should look like is put your dog in the stay. She, they halt. Then you do your distance or your criteria or whatever. And then you say your release word. So you'll say yes. Then the dog moves, then the reinforcer comes out in that order, okay? If the reinforcer is coming out before the dog has moved, then likely the reinforcer is acting as your release in lieu of what should be your actual release, like yes or a release word. The biggest mistake I see that owners make, and a couple of trainers too, um, and it's a bit of a pet peeve, I'll be honest, guys. <laughs> um, the biggest mistake that kind of gets under my skin is that people will put their dog in a stay without knowing ahead of time what their criteria is. And what this usually looks like is that the person puts the dog in a stay and then just walks away arbitrarily at an arbitrary distance and stays away for an arbitrary amount of time. And they usually just have it in their mind, well, let's just see how long the dog can last. And the worst thing you can do <laughs> when you're training stay, the worst thing, is to put your dog in a stay and just see how long they'll last. Because if you don't even know what your goal is for your dog, how is your dog going to know what their goal is? And we wanna be setting up our dog for success. So if you just go in with some arbitrary, open-ended criteria, you're pretty much guaranteeing that ultimately your dog's gonna fail at some point and then you're gonna to have to just put him in that stay again. And what ends up happening here is that dogs start thinking that stay is a negatively reinforced or non-reinforced behavior. And so they don't look forward to doing it because to them it just means that they get stuck in this cycle of being still, being still, being still for no reason whatsoever. That's why it's so important that you know ahead of time before you put your dog in that stay, before you even call for your dog's attention, know what your criteria is. Know how long is he supposed to be in that stay for? How far away are you going to walk from him? Now, let's say that you put your dog in a stay and you want to build up for 25 seconds. Your criteria for this stay is 25 seconds and you, you're counting one, two, three, four, and at 21 seconds, your dog gets up and breaks before you have the opportunity to release. Most people would then put the dog back in the stay and try to go for that 25 seconds again. I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is put the dog in a stay and this time, just count to 20 seconds. Again, this goes back to setting your dog up for success. If 21 seconds is where they failed, then 20 seconds is where they succeeded, which means that's your new criteria. And in theory, if you're always setting up fair criteria for your dog, they'll never fail at all. That's the perfect setup. But we're realistic and we know that we're humans and we know that we're gonna make mistakes. So if you do put your dog in a stay that they're not quite ready for and the criteria was too high, then finding that out and readjusting it the next time for the next repetition to a more fair criteria is absolutely critical to getting your dog to listen in the future. Now, teaching stay is really about teaching impulse control, and I have created an entire video on how to teach your dog impulse control and why it's so important and how to use it throughout their life. And it looks like this. I'm going to link that one at the end of my video as well. But we want to make sure that when we're teaching impulse control, we're aware that this is a learned behavior and that we're treating it fairly. 
and I have created a four part guideline that you can use for stay and you can actually use for any behavior whatsoever to make sure that you are setting up a proper fair criteria for your dog. And I'm going to be sharing that four part guideline with you in my next video. So make sure you hit subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified when that video goes live. It is going to be a very, very, very helpful behavior that you can use with any of your stays, but you can also use with any of your behaviors as well. And in the meantime, between this video and next video, make sure you follow me on Instagram at dog underscore liaison. That was totally my dog just shaking right now. Um, dog underscore liaison and make sure that you comment below what strategies you use to teach your dog stay and if any of these mistakes you've been guilty of in the past. Uh, I want to hear about it and let me know if this comment was helpful by liking it and I'll see you guys soon.